Our final session today is on resiliency opportunities. I'd like to welcome up our presenters, Dr. Joshua Daskin, Lori Miller, and Jim Strickland. Dr. Joshua Daskin is the Director of Conservation at Archibald Biological Station, where he promotes the use of science in the conservation of biodiversity and ecosystems. He leads development and implementation of Archibald's conservation strategy, connecting researchers with agencies, landowners, NGOs, and science collaborators to grow the efficacy and effectiveness of conservation actions, including leading the scientific arm of the campaign to conserve the corridor. Dr. Daskin earned a bachelor's in biology and environmental studies from Brandeis University, a master's in zoology, while a Fulbright scholar at James Cook University in Australia, and a PhD in ecology and evolutionary biology from Princeton University. Lori Miller implements sea level rise analysis and other climate environmental trends into the refuge management throughout the Gulf Coast Refuge Complex, the state of Florida, and the Caribbean refuges as a climate scientist. She is also the acting project leader of the Everglades Headwaters National Wildlife Refuge and Conservation Area. She also serves on a White House subcommittee to the Interagency Council on the Advancement of Meteorological Services, which include weather, climate, climate change, hydrology, and ocean science. Ms. Miller received a master's in environmental engineering degree in water resource planning and management from the University of Florida and a bachelor's degree in, meteorologic, in meteorolo ugh, sorry, meteorology from the University of St. Thomas. Jim Strickland is the owner of Strickland Ranch and managing partner of the Big Red Cattle Company and Blackbeard's Ranch, a 4,430 acre cow-calf operation that borders Mayaka River State Park. Mr. Strickland is with the Florida Climate Smart Agriculture Work Group, a collaboration between the Solutions from the Land and the University of Florida's Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences, focused on identifying and implementing climate smart agricultural solutions and ecosystem services that benefit the public, producers, and the planet. He currently serves as vice chairman of the Florida Conservation Group, who educates, supports, advises landowners, and facilitates conservation easements and other conservation incentive programs. He is also the past president of the Florida Cattlemen's Association and the past chairman of the Florida Cattlemen Foundation, and was awarded the Sustainable Rancher of the Year Award in 2019 by Audubon, Florida. Thank you all for being here, especially given our last session of the day. We are very much excited to hear what you have to say. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Dr. Daskin. Thank you very much, Jennifer, and thanks everybody for sticking around to the end. Uh, I'll try to bring some energy to the last, the last set here. Uh, so I am going to be speaking about uh, a soon to be released report on all the ways that the Florida Wildlife Corridor, which you most likely are familiar with, but I'll tell you a little bit about, intersects with climate resilience statewide. So, uh, like Jennifer said, I'm the Director of Conservation at a place called Archbold Biological Station. Uh, if you're not familiar with us, we are a 20,000 acre, 70 employee research, conservation, and education center in Highlands County, uh, where Commissioner Kerouac comes from as well. And uh, so we're actually just outside the CHNEP boundary, but we like to think of ourselves as perched on uh, the ridge, the Lake Wales Ridge in particular, that flows to ranches like Mr. Strickland's, uh, then to rivers, and eventually to the reefs. So we're definitely all connected. And a lot of the work that we do at Archbold touches on agriculture and ranches in particular that affect um, places within the CHNEP boundary. I am not gonna spend a lot of time belaboring the introduction here because we've heard all about the impacts of climate change in the last two days, but uh, just suffice to say, populations are growing in the state. Some of the counties in uh, the CHNEP boundary are expected to see a 70% or more increase in populations between 2020 and 2045. Meanwhile, we're dealing, of course, with sea level storms, increasing fire risk, and increasing heat. These two maps here show that um, statewide we're expected to see 30 or more additional days above 95 degrees comparing the present to 1900 
based on a two or three degree Fahrenheit increase in temperatures. So these coupled increases in population and climate change risk touch all the sectors of our economy and our communities. That includes natural resources management, tourism, agriculture, conservation, the military, and commercial enterprises. Also relevant to all sectors of Florida uh, and all the stakeholder groups in this room is the extremely ambitious Florida Wildlife Corridor effort, <coughs> which you again likely will have heard of, but if not, it's an effort to conserve connected wildlife habitats that span from the southern terminus of our state in the Everglades up to the boundary with, with Alabama and uh, Georgia. It's about 50% of our state's land area, and it is about 55% already conserved. So the dark green areas on this map are conserved areas, and the light green are what we refer to as opportunity areas. It's totaling not quite 18 million acres, uh, both the conserved and opportunity areas together. Um, and it's the vision of conservationists and scientists in the state that have developed this idea over the last 30 years, and particularly uh, Tom Hochter at the University of Florida, who keeps the map that defines this boundary. Uh, it was recognized unanimously as a priority for state conservation uh, by the state legislature. I'll say that again in case anyone has forgotten in three years. It was unanimous, pretty cool. Um, and uh, this is really something to be proud of. It's the most ambitious state conservation plan in the US. Uh, why do we have a wildlife corridor? Why do we need a wildlife corridor? Well, it's got the word wildlife in it, so we're going to start there. Uh, ecologically, connecting wildlife habitats is really key. There are considerable impacts to genetics, demography, pollination, animal behavior and movement, the abundance of populations, how many wildlife there are, that is, microclimates, really local weather, that is, um, the persistence and behavior of species, all of which, uh, if they're not uh, uh, conserved, leads to the decline of populations and extinctions when we create islands of habitat like this one here in the top right. So if we have islands of habitat left in a sea of development, it's fragmented, species have a hard time moving, and all of those things I mentioned, population demography, genetics, decline. The graph here shows the results of an Archbold study comparing the genetic diversity of Florida scrub jays, our only endemic bird, uh, that's, that means it only lives in Florida in the whole world, uh, in natural areas, so they're connected, and suburban areas just north of Archbold. And you can see that the birds living in the fragmented area have lower genetic diversity, which is related to population declines. And in fact, over the 30 years that we've been studying the species there, the scrub jays have in fact declined in that neighborhood. Connectivity, uh, which is connecting, uh, like connecting across the Caloosahatchee River here in the bottom right, uh, which is really key for the panther population being able to expand, gives wildlife options for how to escape from disturbances. That's one way to think of it. So it might be from a really quick pulse disturbance, like a fire, a storm, or a flood. Or it might be for a longer term type of movement, like moving north or inland from sea level rise uh, to escape climate change impacts. Uh, some of you may have been in the room when last year I presented to the CHNEP Technical Advisory Committee uh, about a report that Archbold spearheaded and that was led by the University of Florida Water Institute on all the ways that water resources intersect with the Florida Wildlife Corridor. If you're not familiar with the report, I encourage you to check out the QR code here and to go to our website where you can find it. This is an example of uh, part of my role at Archbold and Archbold's role in particular, uh, more generally, in the corridor campaign, which is to convene scientists to answer key questions that will help us prioritize and value conservation of the corridor. What does it take to con conserve 18 million acres? Why should we do it? What will be the benefits to people, to nature, to economies, to agriculture? And crucially, what can the corridor not do for resilience and for other things that our societies benefit? When we as the conservation community go and speak on behalf of the wildlife corridor, we have to do it credibly, and that means saying when there's something that the corridor will not do for us. We learned a lot of things out of this water resources report, like the 
The wildlife corridor is actually really good for a lot of our water resources, particularly surface water wetlands, rivers, which are connected just like a corridor. Uh, but it's not as good at protecting others like uh, aquifer recharge. Kind of makes sense when you think about it. The best aquifer recharge areas are really high sandy soils that we've mostly already converted for agriculture or for development. So that points to the need for other solutions. Nonetheless, the report pointed to a lot of co-benefits of wildlife conservation and land conservation for other aspects of our societies. The interest in these sorts of co-benefits of land conservation with other things that we value extends to climate change. And so we are not the first, Archbold or the Corridor Campaign, we are not the first to think about the overlaps of land conservation and climate resilience. And I'll point you to a couple of resources for those who are interested. The first one on the top of the slide here comes from the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And they did a national survey of large landscape conservation initiatives, looking to see how are these land conservation groups addressing climate change. And most of them are talking about climate resilience. Most of them are mentioning potential co-benefits. Nearly half of them indicated that climate adaptation or mitigation is a focus of their work. Uh, but it's not the leading priority for most of them. There's not a lot of intentionality, you might say, uh, about how large landscape conservation is overlapping with climate resilience. The good news is that there's hope that the two will be overlapping more deliberately in the future. So uh, I point to the Natural Resources Conservation Service, uh, part of USDA. They have a series of climate smart mitigation practices, which they are tying lots of their new funding to, and they are ripe with funding for easements, for land management, and for other uh, landowner assistance programs. And then the uh, Readiness for Environmental Protection and Integration program from the Department of Defense uh, really strongly values climate resilience as well in their land protection programs. So uh, beginning in spring of 2023, I approached uh, Dr. Colin Polsky, at the, he's the director of the Center for Environmental Studies at Florida Atlantic University. Uh, along with Professor Jay Baldwin, also from FAU, and asked them to spearhead a report on all things climate resilience and land conservation in Florida. They assembled this, uh, frankly, pretty cool all-star team from five universities, um, agencies, NGOs, for-profit corporations, and I contributed from Archbold. And they were tasked with answering that question, what can the Florida Wildlife Corridors Conservation do for climate resilience? The first step was that in July, we convened a stakeholder group. These, um, these potential end users for the report, mostly nonprofits, also Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission uh, and the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, came to Archbold and heard about the plan for the report, gave us input on what might maybe we should tweak, what Colin and Jay should tweak, I should say, since they were the lead authors and uh, how to message the report back to them at the end so that anything we produce is really actionable. Top level take home message, the Florida Wildlife Corridor is both sensitive to climate change, it's exposed to lots of the risks we've been hearing about, but it is also a world class adaptation plan. So let's start with fire. We can expect that Florida is going to continue seeing an increased frequency of heat waves, decreasing soil moisture as well, which will increase the risk of wildfires in our natural and agricultural habitats. The southern regions of the Everglades, uh, towards the Everglades are likely to experience earlier problems of this sort due to the advanced favorable atmospheric conditions there. So they have a lot of thunderstorms, a lot of lightning, um, potential for droughts. And the corridor provides an opportunity to manage fire in ways that mitigate that risk in an especially economically and ecologically uh, manageable or affordable ways. So if you're a firefighter, you're going to have a much easier time putting out a fire if it's in a big connected landscape, large intact habitat, than if you're trying to put out spot fires next to 20 people's homes and businesses and military installations that you're trying to protect the people and the property there. Uh, so just by being larger, it's easier to manage fire and it's easier to do prescribed fires, which we know are really the key management tool in Florida ecosystems. 
Prescribed fires not only maintain habitat in the natural state that they would have burned historically due to wildfires and make these habitats stay viable for our wildlife, but they reduce fuel that can lead to greater wildfire risk and more intense wildfires if we don't do these prescribed burns. Staying with fire for a moment, I'm going to drill into one particular example in uh, northeastern Highlands County on the edge of the Avon Park Air Force Range, which is the eastern seaboard's most important air-to-ground military training range. Um, having a conserved corridor is not really sufficient for fire management uh, and climate resilience because prescribed fire is what we need. And uh, this area in particular that I've zoomed in on, it's a place called Carter Creek. Some of you in the room may have heard of it. Uh, and it's one example of many across the state where our natural resources agencies are managing a patchwork of ownership. So the green are kind of conserved areas that are owned by the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission in Highlands County. And the, uh, the yellow is owned by the Nature Conservancy. And then the white pockmarks are private inholdings in this area. So this was initially uh, platted development, never really developed. There are only a few scattered houses in there. And there's continuing slow development. Every time there's a new house, it makes it harder for um, the wildlife to be managed for, and it makes, us, makes it harder for those managing this site at, with FWC to go and do a prescribed burn because they have more folks they need to manage around. This really echoes the tenuous situation unfolding for the last decade or two in California and elsewhere in the U.S. West, we're seeing it in Texas this week, um, where prescribed burning has really been neglected over the decades, and we're now left with a very dangerous situation, and there's the opportunity we have the opportunity here in Florida to head that off at the pass. Uh, Archbold, and along with support from the Department of Defense and the Department of the Interior, will be starting up a new fire management team in the next uh, six months, joint with the Avon Park Air Force Range, to be able to supply prescribed burning staffing and equipment throughout the Avon Park Sentinel landscape. That's 800,000 acres extending uh, roughly from Lake Okeechobee uh, up to and beyond the bombing range. Moving now to flooding, uh, the climate section of the forthcoming report, which will be released in about two weeks, uh, was led by Dr. David Zierden. He's the state climatologist based out of Florida State University. And he wrote that we can expect future rainfall in Florida to be more intense, to lead to more runoff and flash flooding, more river flooding, and that we'll see more coastal flooding. So this is that... Um, sort of stacking of different types of flooding. I forget the, the better word for it that the hydrologist speaking earlier used, um, but when you have more than one of those types of flooding and you have impervious surfaces, tides, storm surge, you have a problem. Now some good news is that about two thirds of the remaining natural floodplains in our state um, and 50% of those that have not yet been conserved are in the Florida Wildlife Corridor. So that gives us the opportunity to protect places that act as sponges to keep new properties, new insurance risk, people's lives out of these places that are currently serving us by absorbing high rainfall, uh, flash flooding, river flooding. Um, we're also likely to see more frequent sunny day flooding along the coasts as tides are uh, stacked on top of that sea level rise. We know that mangroves, a coastal ecosystem service provider, can be valued at over $3,300 uh, $3, per acre for providing flood protection against uh, properties that are immediately behind them. The corridor is also uh, quite a good protector of mangroves. Heat, a third type of risk that we're certainly all dealing with as we see advancing climate change. Nationally, there's been an 88% increase in heat-related deaths between 2019 and 2022. That is a short period of time to see almost a doubling in heat-related deaths. We're dealing with the same thing in our communities. Uh, at the recent Avon Park Air Force Range uh, Military Installation Resilience Review that the Central Florida Regional Planning Council led, I heard from the Highlands County Sheriff's Department and Fire Department who said, Heat-related illnesses are one of the biggest risks that they are seeing increase, uh, particularly from some of uh, the more senior populations in the counties. So the corridor 
uh, will provide some mitigation of heat because these open areas, these green areas, mitigate urban heat island effects. We know that our cities with pavement, with impervious surfaces, with reflective rooftops and parking lots are some of the hottest areas and we'll see some of the, the, the greatest heat impacts of climate change. So the green areas in natural lands and uh, agricultural areas are likely to be slightly cooler. That's a good thing. Um, one of these kind of credibility points though, or, or credible ways to speak about the corridor is to acknowledge that conserving the corridor probably will not uh, help the, herb the urban heat island effect in our cities. One of the best things we can do for the corridor, and I'll speak about it in a few more slides, uh, is to build in slightly more dense ways. So put people where there already are people and where there's already infrastructure. The corridor is not going to mitigate heat island effects for them. Uh, all right, back to biodiversity because it is a wildlife corridor. There is refuge provided from climate change impacts uh, for many of our most treasured species and ecosystems in Florida. Although there's not a coherent ecological signature like there is in many parts of North America and other northern regions of species sort of moving en masse northwards to escape climate change, we do see some key species and ecosystems uh, that are responding to temperature and other climate, uh, climate changes. In particular, the southern boundary of the Longleaf Pine Range uh, is moving northwards. The mangroves you heard about yesterday are migrating northwards as well, replacing salt marsh. And some of the invasive species, like pythons, are also certainly moving north. Some of the biodiversity most at risk from climate change are coastal species that are, that are and will be forced to move inland as sea level rises, and so coastal to inland connections provided by the corridor will be key for those species. Sea turtles as well, maybe not protected by the corridor too well, uh, but they are at risk of, uh, of, of declines due to heat and what heat does to how their sex is determined at birth. It actually skews the ratio of males to females. Uh, I'm gonna maybe skip this slide for time because um, I got my warning here, thank you very much. Uh, and just say that one of the really great things about the report is that it points to some win-win solutions. So smart, coordinated development is going to help us with mitigating flooding. It's going to mitigate uh, impacts of climate change by reducing the number, of, the number and the distance of vehicle trips that we have to make um, and by sparing land in the corridor. So the development community and our decision makers have a major role to play in conserving the corridor and finding these solutions. St. Petersburg, where I live, actually is one example, uh, one good example. They recently rezoned all areas with 100, within 150 feet of major roads to be uh, a, a, able to home, house up to four residential units. Uh, another key point in the smart development scenario here is that we need to start thinking about doing away with the piecemeal development approach parcel by parcel decision making. Uh, Commissioner Kerouac mentioned earlier the need to look uh, holistically at stormwater management. The same is true of land use and zoning decisions. Climate finance and all of that federal money that you already heard is available, providing potential opportunities for individual landowners, local, county, state, municipal governments. Uh, if you don't know where to go for this money, uh, ask your regional planning councils, ask me, uh, there are lots of folks who want to help you access that funding. A third benefit of the, uh, uh, another benefit of the corridor campaign for climate resilience is that it has helped generate partnerships like the ones in this room today. So the corridor exists because of decades of partnership among these groups and others that have conserved those 10 million acres that are already protected. Uh, lastly, I will just say that there are some outstanding science needs that include thinking and acting locally. So this is a pretty zoomed out big picture report we're about to uh, release here. And one of their take homes is actually that we need to do the same kinds of resilience studies locally because that's where zoning decisions are made, that's where land use decisions are made, that's where water resources decisions are made. Um, a lot of these studies are already going on at nonprofits, consultancies for individual landowners and inside insurance companies or local governments. We need to be able to surface those information uh, points to be able to plan holistically. Economics of nature, how do we value the services like those 
mangroves that, that are $3,300 an acre, how do we do that for other ecosystem services? We need to uh, mobilize our economists to think about these problems. So uh, thank you very much for listening. I'll leave it there and ask that you stay tuned to Archbold, Florida Atlantic University, um, and Live Wildly, uh, the Live Wildly Foundation's channels. They were the funder of this report um, for its release in about two weeks. All right. Well, first of all, thank you guys so much for being here at almost the end. If you're here for your continuing education credits, I think you should ask for extra credit. And I want to thank also Josh, because he's kind of teed up my presentation, so I may uh, steal a little bit from Josh and build upon his, his presentation. So when you think about or you hear uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, I think a lot of people have one of two thoughts. Um, oh, it's an agency that takes care of the threatened and endangered species. Or, oh, it's the agency that manages these really cool wildlife refuges. While both are true, I'm here to tell you about a new initiative that we're about to break ground with, um, something I'm extremely excited about, and I hope you guys uh, will be too. So who so far in the audience by a raise of hand um, has heard of the Everglades to Gulf Conservation Area? Oh, we have quite a few. All right, so then let's, let's just jump right into it. So first of all, there's a couple of differences between a wildlife refuge and a conservation area. In a refuge, typically our agency owns the land, we manage the land, we have offices, uh, and we have visitor centers. But with a conservation area, um, it's an area that's built more around uh, conservation easements. Um, and so uh, the, with an easement, if there is a willing, and I want to keep stressing this word willing, if there is a willing landowner who would like to put, not sell this property, but put an easement on his property, he continues to own the property, he continues to operate his property, if he has cattle, he can still graze his cattle. Um, if he's a farmer, he continues to farm. But with an easement, I mean, he can even sell his land, but the easement goes with the land. He can hand his land down to his grandson. The easement still goes with the land. So all we ask, uh, really, of the owner is to maintain your property, um, treat the invas any invasive uh, vegetation, and don't do things like digging ditches or ponds or disturbing the habitat and that type of thing. You know, let's protect the, the property. Don't subdivide. Don't put it up for um, uh, development. And um, understanding that Fish and Wildlife Service has the right to maintain and improve uh, upland habitats and also uh, wetlands. So we're in it together. And again, it's all completely 100% volunteer uh, on these, on these uh, programs. So we have, as we've talked about for the last two days, we have some natural resource threats. First is the development of a lot of our green space. Um, we continue uh, to increase our nutrient loads into our waterways creating those harmful algal blooms, which, which are toxic not only to wildlife, but also to humans. Um, and then thirdly, uh, the climate change, which we've been talking a lot, a lot about the last couple of days, and um, sea level rise, and then adding high tide effects on top of that as well. So what our agency decided to do was, let's just kind of look at things. Um, what can we do to help bring back add to resiliency for not only Southwest Florida, South Florida, also Central Florida. So we kind of studied, and you can see the hatched area behind me. Um, that kind of started out as about seven or eight million acres that we just looked at and said, let's kind of tighten this up and see where we can really uh, get the biggest bang for our buck. So we looked, um, included the greater Everglades. It included places like Fish Eating Creek, uh, Peace River, um, let's see what else, yeah, Caloosahatchee. 
And so we kind of narrowed it down to about 4 million acres. Now, during this process, um, about a year ago, we started with our scoping. And it was about this time uh, last year. And we included 70 um, agencies along with other groups into the scoping process. So what you'll see is we've got actually it, it, it increased from 2,600 comments to 3,000 comments, and we were 99% positive uh, comments. So everyone's on board, the public's on board. Um, so this, to me, is one of the most exciting things that we have going right now. Um, so everyone was wildly supportive, and again, um, a lot of the talk was from landowners about these easements or someone who wants to sell their land. All right, so the planning team, we included uh, the tribes of Florida. We in included the state of Florida, including FDEP, FWC. Every arm of Fish and Wildlife Service was included on the uh, planning team, as well as the University of Florida. You heard uh, Josh speak of Dr. Hawker. Um, he's been a, an incredible uh, influence on this because he is the director of the Center of Landscape Conservation Planning with U of F, and also the National Wildlife Refuge Association and the Florida Conservation Group helped us um, with the, the scoping as well. All right, so starting out with our objectives, some of these get a little redundant, so I'm going to focus on just a, a few of them. The first couple um, are really important. We want this conservation area to help with Everglades restoration. We're hoping to protect our watersheds. Let's try to help clean the water. Let's keep kind of development a little bit at bay. Let's keep the green spaces. Um, and, you know, we have almost 70 threatened and endangered species in this state alone. And they've got to live somewhere, and they have to be able to move somewhere. And so we're wanting to put all of these threats together uh, with our conservation area. We also are trying to, you know, Florida is very unique and, and original, and we're trying to keep <laughs> remnants of the old Florida still intact. So we want to continue to do that, but we're also working with our partners that have other conservation initiatives in place. So we're not in competition with the state of Florida. We want to work with them. If they have, let's say, 1,800 acres of a wildlife management um, area, we want to work with them. So probably what I would think is that if there's some land that's for sale along the edges of that, or if, if a rancher or farmer wants to put an easement on their property, then we're making that conservation area even bigger. So it's, you know, we're working together. We're not in competition. We want to work together on the conservation area. And one of the most exciting parts of this, you know, I've been working in Everglades restoration uh, for probably about 15 years. And one thing that's really been troubling to me for that entire time is how are we going to get our critters north of the I-4 corridor? You know, it's like, what do we do? They, you know, with sea level rise coming and urban development, they're being kind of squeezed inland and they're being squeezed north. How are we going to get them around I-4 without, and I hate to say it, without becoming roadkill? I mean, basically, we've got to figure out a way to get around that. So one of the most uh, exciting things to me is, if you look in our boundary, and think of this as an acquisition boundary, we're not coming in and taking this land, but if someone lives in this area, they're in our um, acquisition boundary, we can talk to them about it. You know, we can start the planning process for that. But there's the I-4, and you'll see that we have pushed our boundaries up to and north of I-4, hoping that we can get our hands on some land, whether it's a purchase or whether it's an easement, so you know our critters can move north and get, whether they're going under I-4, we don't have that figured out yet, we gotta get the land and think about it, but uh, at least we're gonna work our way to being able to move our critters north into central Florida. So during the planning process, we looked at several models. We have 12 models, and a lot of them were run by the state of Florida. 
Um, and so we have, we looked at the ecological priorities, whether it's habitat, whether it's connectivity. Um, but with these 12 models, you'll see behind me that some of the areas are really dark green. And those are the, the ecological priorities of the state of Florida, and we wanted to include them in this conservation area. So we kind of can bring our focus into where exactly do we want to think about buying land or using easements um, for the corridor. All right, and then the, the priorities themselves, again, another uh, uh, study from the state of Florida, is if you'll see behind me again, there some of the areas, I want to make sure, are gray. Well, those are already in conservation, so that's good. But the dark blue, the navies that you see around that, those are areas that are, are ecological priorities or, or protection opportunities, we'll say. And so you'll see that they're kind of up against those already gray areas. So we'd like to kind of build off of what's already out there and kind of expand it out. Then there's the Florida 2070 report that talks about um, land, future land use and urbanization. And the green hatched areas are already in conservation. And then you'll see we start to move into kind of a peachy color to really uh, dark red colors. Those are hot spots uh, that are already exhibiting uh, pressure from urbanization. So we have some of those areas now within this conservation, uh, conservation area. And then we're going to talk a little bit about climate change. Um, I know that Noah did a fantastic job yesterday on talking about all of the variables of climate change and how they're expected to, to either increase or decrease, improve, or, or you know, not so much. <laughs> so just three that I wanted to hit on, and that is we have hit a record um, for our carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, 417 parts per million. That is 50% greater than what it was in 1850, but it's also the highest on our uh, modern, in our modern atmospheric records, and it's the highest that's ever been recorded using core, or ice core samples dating back almost a million years. So uh, that's an incredible, not so much of a record that we'd like to hit, but, but we've done it. And then the global land and ocean temperatures, um, uh, the fifth warmest year um, since the mid 1800s, and global sea level rise has hit four inches since 1993. One of my favorite slides that I continue to use over and over <laughs> is that sea level variations happen. So the first graphic, the green is what Florida looks like 120,000 years ago when we had sea level rise of 20 feet. Now half of that was determined to be from Greenland ice melt, the other half was from the Antarctic ice melt. The middle graphic, we had a drop in sea level of 420 feet 1,800 years ago, and that's what Florida looked like. You can see how it really expanded, a very wide peninsula. And then, of course, next to that is what we look like today. So variations happen, um, and so we're on our own track now uh, to see what's going to happen. All right, so I wanted to put, kind of bring it into the big picture. Um, you'll see the pink hatched areas are already either National Wildlife Refuges or the big pink area on the northern part of the map. That's Everglades Headwaters Refuge and Conservation Area. So you'll see that the yellow is the new Everglades to Gulf Conservation Area. And it, as you'll notice on purpose, we've, we've kind of moved it, you know, butted up next to Everglades Headwaters. So we have now this big conservation area. And again, I don't know if I mentioned it, but that conservation area is 4 million acres. 4 million acres. And Fish and Wildlife Service can actually buy 10% of that. That's 400,000 acres that we have to, we can buy land from willing owners that are just ready to, to sell and, and they have the proper habitat and we have some improvements that we can make. So 
Four million acres, this is gonna be the largest uh, conservation area in the country. Let me back up, there we go. I also, on this graphic, I added sea level rise, as you can see, the dark blue is two foot, the medium blue is four foot, the light blue is six foot. And I wanted you to see how we've kind of, we've got the conservation area around the edges of sea level rise, but we're, we're mostly out of that immediate sea level rise if it only goes up six, six feet. Um, and the dates really don't matter because it's gonna happen you know, when it happens. But the main thing is we've got the conservation area, I think, placed just right around the sea level rise so that the critters and the mangroves and uh, vegetative communities can all move with the changing conditions. And then if we add high tide to this, so now this graphic, the red around the fringes of Florida is your six foot rise, but you see the yellow hatches, that's gonna be wet areas during high tide. So you've got sea level rise, and then we have high tide. That's a lot of wet Florida. <laughs> it is a lot of wet Florida. So always, when you're thinking about sea level rise, think about adding the high tide. And then I also want you to remember one thing, and that is that a lot of, with sea level rise and saltwater intrusion, as the water moves inland, it's already affecting your root zone before you even see it on land. So root zones go sometimes two feet down or four feet down, depending on the tree or the shrub or what have you. Things start to happen before that sea level rise actually hits your location. It already starts to affect the, the root zone. So don't forget, think out ahead of the game with, uh, with your root zone. So that's it for me. I appreciate, again, you guys sticking around to the very end. Um, here's a, our website for more information. I, I'm excited about this. I hope you guys are too, and we're ready to talk about it. So whenever you guys are ready, we're ready. <laughs> I'm Jim Strickland, and I am not a scientist. I'm not a researcher, nor a statistician. I might be a conservationist type cowboy. I've got a high school education, barely. I had to check the other day to see if I could go to my high school 50 year reunion, and that's a true story because I didn't remember whether I graduated or not. But I truly love Florida, and I truly appreciate all these folks like these people and everybody else that has presented because I'm in the land and the cattle business. Without y'all, everybody in this room, whether you're an NGO with the government or you're not with the government or whether you're an independent scientist or a researcher or just a caring citizen or you're a mayor of a city or a county commissioner, we're all here because we care about something. And I think it's Florida. And I damn well know it, Florida. And we care about Florida because of many different reasons, but it all comes back to whatever reason you have, it comes back to the fact that we care. And you're sitting in this room, and it's really appreciated. So here's a, here's a, day, here's a day in my life. I've been in Tallahassee since Sunday night lobbying for conservation easement funding. I got in about 3 o'clock this morning. My cowboys and nobody has seen me for four days. They're still, we need some sort of evidence that I was here. Uh, or else I think I went on a vacation. Mr. Strickland, we're burning woods in DeSoto County in case the mayor of Arcadia is still here. There's, there was a wildfire on our ranch in DeSoto County. It got, but it got put out if he's still here. There, it flipped over a, a fire guard, and, uh, but it hit a marsh. Mr. Strickland, you have a dead bull over, over at the uh, Cross Creek pasture. You know, what do we do with it? You know, do we do an autopsy? That's kind of the things that we do every day. And that's why I appreciate all of these folks that put the statistics and the data and the research together and bring it forth to where you can actually help us defend what we do. I think this is a wonderful picture. I stuck it in there because I love Florida. 
My partner, my partner and I, we actually own around 15,000 acres scattered across mainly Florida, a little bit in Georgia. We lease 5,000 acres that I traded my development rights off a piece of property I owned in Manatee County for a 20-year grazing lease on a piece of property because I love the cattle business too. So instead of getting money, I took a 20-year grazing lease because I always love land. Well, we forgot to tell some people about this approximately 5,000 acre ranch that we bought over next to Mike State Park. We forgot to, and he, once the stage was set, he didn't want to tell his wife about it for two years. So finally, she, we decided we were going to bring her out and show her, show her the ranch. And, and he goes, what are we going to do? I said, well, I dug a heart-shaped pond. <laughs> and he flies a helicopter in. That's usually the way we, not we move, the way we move, he moves. And so there's a helicopter landing pad right off to the bottom left-hand side. And I say, whenever you fly in, you have the pilot circle from the south, come in, come in from the south, and say, honey, I really love you. <laughs> okay, now I'm not real smart, but I figured that one out. If I hadn't told, if I hadn't told a wife that I, have, I bought 5,000 acres and forgot to tell her, I'd do the same thing. I think I'm trying to get my point across. So what, what is the Florida Climate Smart Agricultural Group? I can tell you that they're international. They are nearly at every COP conference, United Nations conference that happens anywhere, anywhere, anywhere in the world. They have really got aggressive on being and uh, taking farmers to all of these different places that United Nations holds meetings. They've been to COP27. I'm, I'm sure I'm going to get some of this wrong, so bear with me. COP27, COP28, United Nations Environmental Assembly. Uh, let me see, where are they at today? Nairobi. Uh, we've been to Dubai, Rome, Egypt, uh, FAO, Committee on World F Food Security. We presented at all of those different things. We are agriculture land-based, using researchers like everybody ha has presented in this room. What this was started for was to show the, the advantages of green space that we can maintain if we have climate change. Remember there was a time we couldn't pronounce climate change nor, nor could we talk about it in the state of Florida. So now that we can, you can say climate change any time, but we wanted to see what could mitigate the environmental impacts of climate change and sea level rise, and it is not going to be pavement. It's going to be green space. So that, that's our mission. This is how, this is how I got here, um, which was kind of a strange story. But uh, anyhow, keep me straight on time, whoever's giving me the flash down here. Um, so Lynetta Griner and I decided that we would co-chair. Lynetta Griner is one of my business partners. She's a timber owner, was the first lady that was ever the president of the uh, Florida Forestry Association. She's an attorney. Her husband and I are, are also business partners, and we felt like the two of us coming from North Florida, her, me from South Florida primarily, timber owner with a cow guy, that maybe we, would, maybe we could work together. We then reached out to every commodity known in Florida. We even reached out to the bivalve community, to the Ed Childs of the world, to Heath Davis, that was the mayor of Cedar Key that's in the bivalve business up there. They're all on our board of directors, Scott Carraway. Is he still here? Scott left. He's on our board. We also have about 15 or 20 professors from University of Florida on our board. We got the chief science officer for the governor and uh, the head of DEP and the head of NRCS, Juan Hernandez, that sit, that sit, on, our, sit on our board. And whenever I was asked, I didn't know what to do, and I really didn't understand climate change or sea level rise, and that is honest. So who did I call? But I called my friend, Dr. Tom Hochter, that's been referenced several times with the Florida Ecological Green Wets Network and Center for Landscape Planning. I'm sure I butchered that one, too, by the way. Um, he is a dear friend of ours. And I called Tom, and I said, could you come to the ranch? He spent two days at the ranch with me. And he explained climate change to me as best he could, and then I really grasped it, so I decided that I would co-chair it with Lynetta. These are, some, these are some of our issues. Everybody in this room has already seen these. There's been so many pre presenters, but I can tell you global challenges, 
2050 projected 9.9 .9 billion people. That is why we need things like Thousand Friends just funded, the Florida Department of Agriculture Consumers just funded, the 2040 plan, the 2070 plan to where we can have a crystal ball of what, uh, what due to trends are we going to see in the future as far as growth, coupled with something like Josh has done on his uh, wildlife corridor project. So I think if we now have that information and we keep updating that information, that will tell us where we've been and where we're going and a lot of factors affecting where we're, where we're going. Farmland conversion, you've already heard it all. Uh, you know what's going on. Uh, here is here's what we really want to tout on is agriculture directly influences or underpins more than half of the United Nations sustainable development goals. Number one is no poverty. That's one of the things that I think of. I've been called while I was in Tallahassee to discuss the fabricated meat product. Well, I'm in the cattle business. Meat is meat. As far as I'm concerned, milk is milk. Almond milk is, you know, but that's, but that's the way I come from. By the way, I drink almond milk every morning in my smoothie. However, so what am I going to say? But I, I have been fortunate enough that I traveled the world internationally and I've seen starving people in a lot of different countries that if I can fabricate a product, call it anything you will, but feed those people, feed those children. We have poverty here in the United States. We have hunger here by masses in the United States. That's number one. I think it needs to stay number one, and you have to have agriculture to do it. The Florida uh, Ecosystem Services Work Plan, this is what we have attempted to do with grant money, philanthropic money, and legislative budget money. Quantifying and value agro-ecosystem services using artificial intelligence. I call it cap, uh, natural capital. That's what we call, that's what we call it, is natural capital. These are the things that we're trying to do. Create an AI harvest, a hub for agricultural reporting, verification ecosystem services through sensing technology, hence AI. We're huge proponents of AI. We have fought for budgets for AI technology for the Hypergator and the AI Hub for University of Florida and Wyamama. We have done a lot of different things because we know we have to have that research. We have to have that technology and AI is going to make the difference. We have implemented a healthy farm, healthy bay program where we're testing all the water along the Suwannee, uh, Suwannee River from different farms and conservation areas and going down to the Gulf where the bivalve industry is. That's why we picked that place was we had, we had a lot of researchers from University of Florida IFAS there. We have used a tremendous amount of drones uh, collecting data. Uh, our ranch in Marion County, one of our ranches in Manatee County, we are using as test ranches. We're using Lanetta grinders and we're using one in, in Mariana. With the money we got from the legislature, we are, doing, we are doing these studies. We're also doing chlorophyll studies as with LIDAR and radar and, and a lot of overlays that are, that are working on. You just found out I'm really not a scientist. That's what I know. I can, I can tell you that, but I can't explain it to you. We have really worked to advocate for funding. It comes down in so many times, it, come, it comes down to money, money. It comes down, if, if U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is going to buy something, what do they need? Money. If FDAX with the Rural Family Lands Program, money. If you're a landowner, what do you need? Money. It all comes down to money, and that's why we need everybody in this room to help realize continually that we can all use different products. We can recycle. Some of the times we can't as landowners. We can't do what you do because you live in a little different world. Not a better world, not a worse world, just a different world. But we have the ability, if you help us, to save millions of acres of land. Particularly in Florida, we have the ability to save hundreds and hundreds of thousands of acres. Right now, I think there's 370,000 acres of willing ranchers that are on the books that they want uh, conservation easements through rural family lands program. Then couple that with the NRCS programs. Then couple that with DEP in Florida Forever, which is one of the finest pristine wilderness-type preservation plans in the nation. 
We also need to realize that as we got into this thing about carbon sequel, excuse me, as we got into about climate change and sea level rise, that if we don't save land, we won't have anything to work with. So that's why we really then slanted, changed, and morphed into agro-system services or natural capital assets. That now we're trying to document all of what we have and what it's worth, and that's why folks like Archibald, folks like IFAS, you know, we're doing a carbon sequestration study on our ranch. I have one herd of cows with AI technology, uh, a whole herd of cows. Each one of them has a Verizon cell phone around their neck. And they have a GPS unit around their neck that I can change their grazing patterns by the stroke of a mouse on a computer every single hour. I can actually bump those cows with a line, an electric line that moves across that actually gathers cattle. The things that we're going to be able to do today, five years now, we'll think would be archaic. I can't call my cows, but I know where they're at. <laughs> and I know where they've been because I can track them every 30 minutes. It, it will move. This is one of the, this is a similar map to, that you have seen, uh, shows you where we're going to be and where we're coming. I go back again to thank you. Florida Conservation Group actually partnered with these folks with Thousand Friends of Florida, Geoplan Center, and FDAX on, on these plans, and we were proud, we're proud of it. Climate Smart Ag. I wish I could just hand this out to you because, it, because I think I have done a pretty good job of explaining to you what we are looking for in the future based on the path and what are we going to do in between as individuals, as groups, as a country, as a state, or as a, or as a world. We have been a great benefit, beneficiary of some federal funding, America the Beautiful, Inflation Reduction Act. I know right now that, that we are working with a, a, lot, a lot of money with our, I'm, I just changed over from Solutions to the Land to Florida Conservation Group that we're working with a lot of money uh, that has become available that's going to move the needle. And a lot of you in this room are doing the same thing. You know, we're planning, we're planning for the future. Here's what really upsets me is congressional dysfunction. Just last night, we extended the farm bill. Last night to March the 8th. Oh, thank God, we extended the farm bill. The farm bill is the one that actually funds so many of these conservation programs that we all depend on, the cost shares we depend on. What y'all as voters have said you wanted to do. The Democrats are blaming the Republicans, the Republicans are blaming the Democrats. The House is blaming the Senate, and the Senate's blaming the House. And we're talking about closing our government down. I sit, I am a, I am a Secretary of Agriculture appointee to a three-portion board in Florida that we manage every major agricultural money that comes out of Washington has to flow through us to get to NRCS. If, if last night they had not done a continuing uh, resolution, we would have had to shut our computers down and all employees would have had to go home. That's congressional dysfunction. And it's really upsetting to some of us that make our living from this. Uh, drought insurance. I don't know where that climate scientist was we talked about earlier this morning, but I need him. I can tell you, I buy drought insurance. My premium can run up to $138,000 a year. For the last five out of seven years, that has almost paid my bills because if you're looking at $700 calves that cost you $500 to produce, not a lot of money. It, we have been in a drought situation for five or seven years that it's under the threshold of which NRCS and USDA has determined that I can buy drought insurance. That's what it costs me with them, this is another part of the farm bill, them paying part of my premium. It's kind of kept us in business. I have to monetize everything, everything I do. So I close this out. I was born here. I'm making plans for my children right now for the future of our land. I don't know when we're going to die, but we all are. 
And whether you're leaving them a watch or a house or, or a piece of dirt, like I hope to leave my children a piece of dirt, we have to make the best of it while we're here. And I think that's why everybody in this room is here. We all want to be better. We want to make Florida better. So I need you. As a landowner, I need you. I need you for your science. I need you because Scott Kerouac mentioned it, he stole my thunder, that less than 2% of the population comes from agriculture and the rest is you or you. It's not me. I only have this many votes. On 15,000 acres, I have about seven. How many do you have in your backyard? Donations, cash donations. It comes a lot more from residential areas than it does from agricultural operations. I need you. I need the research. I truly need the research and the science. I spoke to a group of University of Tampa students last week at a class of environmental science slash political science, and I said, we need you. We, I don't care if you never farmed, we need you. We also need you to lobby for us. I don't like to ask anybody for anything. But we need you to lobby for agriculture because I think if we're going to save Florida, just like I happen to see, oh, by the way, I don't know what those little stems are back there. They look like edible pasta. Okay, you won't find those at many ranchers' homes. But y'all know how to do it. Those are the kind of things that, that really resonate with people so you can help us that we have the land. All those little things. We all work together. And I don't know how to thank you, Jennifer, for inviting me. But uh, it's much appreciated. Thank you, ma'am. If you haven't already put in your uh, questions, feel free to do so now. We're going to go to the mentee, and we'll start reading off some questions for our panelists. Regenerative agriculture has been shown to sequester carbon dioxide, which is a major, wait, which is the primary gas responsible for our climate crisis. To what degree is regenerative agriculture being used in Florida? I think that one is for you, Jeff. I think it's for me and, and a whole bunch of forage agronomists, soil scientists, and uh, climate change experts. Regenerative agriculture, and, and we talk about resiliency, and we talk about sustainability, and we talk about regenerative. Uh, whenever, you talk, whenever we talk about that, I think it has a great amount of optimism. A great amount of optimism. The problem is that the devil's in the details, and I feel like the old snake oil salesman that came through the old west towns, I feel like I'm one of those townspeople, that we have dealt and heard from so many different carbon sequestration people, companies, you know, that are wanting to do something. I almost now feel like we need, truly need the government in, in some sort of stand, um, standardized program to where we know. I have talked with people from Ireland, I've talked to people from Brazil, I've talked to people from France, California, all over, and I'm a little confused when we get done. There is some opportunities, and there's some real pitfalls left there, but, but we truly do have uh, some opportunities. We just started a carbon sequestration study on one piece of one ranch. I believe Archibald has one, University of Florida has one, and uh, I think that just like I beg for research, I'm begging for re more research on that, on that study, and, and Josh can tell you what they're doing. Thanks, Jim. Um, I totally agree with everything you said, that um, the, the carbon market world has huge potential, but is also hugely complex and complicated um, and difficult for everyone to understand, whether you're a scientist or a landowner or a regulator or a policymaker. Um, and Jim is also right, we have just finished off uh, what we think is the first full carbon accounting for a Florida ranch at our 10,500 acre ranch, Buck Island Ranch. And uh, it's a pretty interesting story. In a normal year, we are a very slight sink. So we are pulling in a little bit more carbon than our operation produces. Pretty cool for a cattle ranch, not the usual story. Um, but probably typical of a South Central Florida cattle ranch. Um, it gets more complicated though, because in a wet year, our seasonal wetlands are holding more water 
and there's more methane that naturally comes out of those wetlands. That's not necessarily a bad thing. It is not a reason to drain the wetlands. It is not a reason to cover your wetlands with dirt or fill them in. Um, it's just nature. And so what this points to is that there are complexities in what are people going to actually pay for when we pay a rancher to store carbon? How are we going to measure it? How are we going to regulate it? Um, and there is a lot of potential to it, but I think we're not quite there yet. All right, our next question is for you, Dr. Daskin. Regarding excess heat and temperature rise, do you think the techniques being used in Phoenix to mitigate the issue of high temperatures would be useful in Southwest Florida? I might have to beg out of that one. I'm not sure what, the, what specific techniques there are that are being referenced in Phoenix. If somebody wanted to, to fill in, I'm happy to try, but I'm not sure which, ref, which techniques these are. All right, fair enough. And we'll go to the next one. For rural counties and cities in the corridor and conservation area, is there an associated payment in lieu of taxes program to compensate them for loss of tax revenues as lands are conserved? Uh, yeah, I got my hand up. Yes. In many cases, there are. It depends on the status financially of that county. I can, if, uh, and if, DeSoto, if DeSoto County was here, I'd know that uh, we have had that conversation with them. But keep this in mind. The studies that have been done for, ta for ad valorem tax, which is property tax done, that that study has shown that agricultural lands actually subsidize those people that live in town that for approximately, it depends on what county you live in, but in Manatee County, the last study that was shown that every dollar we pay in taxes costs 40 cents for us. So I know there has been concern and also there's been uh, a lot of conversation lately and I've been part of that rural towns and how they're going to be affected if there's massive amounts of conservation easements around there because they will not have the opportunity for growth. I think it's a discussion to have. There is a there is a payment in lieu of taxes that is a, available to those some of those counties, but now we're not talking like Sarasota, Manatee, Collier, Charlotte. We're not talking about those counties that it won't make any difference. But I can tell you that we still stay on the tax roll. I've I we just recently bought 1,200 acres uh, about four or five weeks ago. And I went down to the property appraiser and I said, okay, do I apply for Greenbelt, which is an agricultural classification for Avalorum taxes, or do I apply for the conservation value of that piece of property? I used to do this. I am half an appraiser. And uh, so I'm, I'm kind of leading you in here. There is very little difference, but most of the time, the ag value, which may, might be, say, $100 an acre, taxable value will be approximately 50% of that. So unless you get into an orange grove situation that some of the times because it's a high income producing area or strawberries, that you'll see something a little bit different, but you do, normally will not see many conservation areas on active orange groves or highly intense farming operations like, like strawberries or, or tomatoes. You just won't see it. Uh, I'll just follow on quickly as well. Um, you know, Jim again said about 98% of the same that I would have. And uh, if folks are interested in that study he referenced that shows agricultural lands subsidize residential areas, they come from the American Farmland Trust. Uh, I'm a biologist, definitely not an economist, and I just learned of these studies about a year ago, and they're fascinating. Um, that, that group, American Farmland Trust, has done these studies. They're called Cost of Community Services Studies across the country, like hundreds of times, and agriculture always, like always, comes out ahead of residential. So again, I agree with Jim that there's a discussion to be had about uh, payments in lieu of taxes, but we shouldn't sweep the really pretty strong evidence that agriculture comes out ahead of residential in terms of municipal finances. All right, our next question is for Lori. Uh, can you use the new wildlife crossing over 10 lanes of US 101 near LA as a model of a wildlife bridge over I-4? I think we're open to just about any idea. 
Um, I know we've been very successful with wildlife uh, crossings underneath US uh, 41 Tamiami Trail uh, down in the south part of, of Florida. Um, so we've got field cameras, we catch panthers and raccoons and everything you can imagine, deer, using that wildlife crossing to get underneath Tamiami Trail instead of, you know, being in the road and being hit by cars. So absolutely, we will look at any technology that comes our way as far as a safe passage for our, what I like to call our critters. All right, the next one is, how is the conservation area funded? And is it believed that there'll be enough consistent federal funding to meet the need and interest? I hope so. That's the plan. Um, I don't have the exact, like, what fund. I, I wish I had others here with me. I was more of a scientist. Um, I'm a, a refuge ecologist and a climate scientist, so I don't have a lot of the policy. Like, I'm going to lean on Jim and Josh a lot on that part. Um, so, yeah, so my understanding is, yes, we have a very strong support uh, all the way up through the Department of Interior, um, all the way up to the, the Biden cabinets. Um, so we're very hopeful that the funding will continue. Great. Our next question, let's see, is how did, wait, how did a conservation area work if it's already developed? I'm not sure. I think I understand the question, okay. but I think you'll, you'll be the one to answer it. I, maybe, the, I think the question is asking sort of what is the difference between a, a conservation area in which you're allowed to buy and what happens to the areas that are already developed within that big boundary? Uh, well, we certainly are not going to move anyone out. Um, we will just perhaps work around them. Um, certainly not going to disrupt people's lives. You know, this is, this is kind of we're, we're trying to help with uh, where we are with the development. And if there is development, um, then certainly we will try just to work around that. Uh, I'd say, too, having been fortunate to be in some of the meetings helping to plan the, the conservation area and the boundary, um, just to be clear, the way it works is that big four million acre boundary is not what's going to get conserved or purchased. That is the area in which the agency has the ability to work with landowners if they, show, if they so choose and if their properties are in a condition that make them a priority for conservation. And it's, just think of it as an acquisition boundary, where if you're within that boundary, then we are able to talk with you about an easement or purchase. But if you're outside the boundary, then, then we cannot. So just think of that boundary as an acquisition boundary that opens up conversations. It's also an opportunity zone. It's an opportunity to start partnering with each other again, but this way is financially. If you be able, you'll be able to take their money in some cases and then partner with state money in some cases and in county money in some cases. So by them drawing a line around that area, that area now is a, uh, there's nothing detrimental about it. And that's one of the things that we really had to work at to make sure that all big landowners, and I was part of that landowner and uh, process explaining to my peer group that, it's, that there's nothing that can happen except good. And we can take federal money, couple it with state money, couple it with county money, and we can accomplish some goals. All right, the next question is for you, Jim. Uh, does the climate, does the Florida Climate Smart Ag Group also help ag and ranch folks with disaster prep and recovery? No, we don't. I can tell you, um, I don't, I, sometimes I wonder who does. That w I, I got hit with, uh, I got hit on five of our seven ranches got hit by Ian. We're sitting there, I think that statistically by NRCS, we said we had about a $2 million loss. And it's been almost, uh, we're about 96 days from the next hurricane season and none of us have seen any money. Um, but there is money there for us for recovery. The problem, you, you know, there's FEMA, which will get buildings, but they don't get anything associated with us. That comes through FSA, Farm Service Agency, or NRCS. Or if you have private insurance, and, and we don't do private insurance on 15,000 acres. But this goes back to the Farm Bill. 
it goes back with we need your voice for lobbying for the farm bill and these continuing re resolutions are killing are killing it you know i mean it's killing us because we don't know what's going to happen that all there's a lot of people all over it orange groves citrus groves uh, farms, ranches, timberland that have been devastated by Hurricane Ian, now Hurricane Idalia, we need to get the money out and we need more employees, federal employees in the state of Florida to help facilitate those things. We have the programs. We have the money. We don't have the employees and the expertise to get that money pumped out to agriculture right now. All right, and the next question is, what will it take to transform conventionally managed private landscapes, commercial and residential, traditional mow and blow services into wildlife friendly and climate friendly management? Why don't you take the residential? Because I am the farmland. Uh, all right, sure. So it's a big question. Um, and I, I think that the residential side, there's kind of the individual homeowner piece. And uh, we heard a little bit earlier, I think there was a question about homeowner water storage. So there are, of course, things you can do that in uh, small ways will cascade individual decisions, certainly can contribute to our overall resilience, uh, whether you're putting solar panels on your roof or storing water or putting native plants in your yard for pollinators and uh, birds and bees. Um, there's also the kind of bigger scale residential things to think about. And so uh, a piece of the Florida Wildlife Corridor campaign has been thinking about what they refer to as the corridor compatible communities approach. Um, this is the idea that large scale developments could be designed and hopefully cited, so placed in the right locations, to be compatible with the corridor. Uh, so you might think about um, the, the, you know, a, a, a developer that owns 10,000 acres and he wants to build some residential on there, uh, maybe he develops 3,000 acres and conserves 7,000 and is able to charge a little bit more because you're living next to nature. I'm not recommending that as the solution for the whole corridor. Uh, it may be one strategy, one tool in the toolbox for the hardest to conserve areas like peri-urban uh, locations right outside Orlando and Kissimmee that are developing fast and where you sort of need to triage a bit. Um, I do want to emphasize that it's not just about design. It's not about um, having 10,000 acres and making sure there are some native plant gardens. It is also about siting again, so making sure you're not choking off the most important parts of the corridor and its connectivity. Um, and it's really about reserving some large chunks while developing um, some pieces in places that have to be built. That was one of the best explanations that I've heard, and I knew it was coming because of the compatible, you know, the wildlife corridor compatible housing group that he's been working on. I think that is one of the answers. Whenever we, t I keep filling with this, this is one of the answers. So is what he's talking about. But the next best thing to pristine wilderness in the state of Florida is a well run cattle ranch. And also, we continually use cost shares to improve those ranches. We all have to operate under best management practices now. So we have to do that. And that, of course, is brought into EP and FDAX and a whole lot of uh, other people to come up with what is a best management practice for a cattle ranch, a forestry, for row crop, for sod, on and on, golf courses, BMPs, best management practices. So we are operating under the auspices of being correct, but we are continually working to improve with a lot of farm bill money, cost share, Department of Agriculture cost share. Cattle ranches that are well run are the next best thing to pristine wilderness. Now. We have a couple cattle ranching questions here. One is, why, when I go to a restaurant, do I not see Florida beef on the menu? And then another one says, how would you expect the Texas buyer to affect the cattle business? That is uh, crazy. I just got three texts from our lobbyist in Tallahassee going, how, how are the, I can't pull them up that quick, how are the fires in Texas going to affect the cattle industry? It depends. Right now, as it's going across, a lot of our cattle leave Florida. We're a cow-calf state. 
we've got approximately 1 million, peop 1 million cows and about 20 million people, but when we had 20 million cows and 1 million people, we didn't ho have a whole lot of environmental problems. Just letting you know. Our cattle will go to Texas, Nebraska, and Oklahoma. When you see those big fires out there, that's where they go to graze because they leave here at about five or 600 pounds. They go out there. They'll spend the winter out there. Most of them will go to a feeding operation out there. We have very few feeding operations, by the way, in Florida. Most of them are green space cow-calf operations. It will affect us. There's a number of cattle out there that are going to die. There's a number of cattle. I've already got two or three of my ranchers that have been shoving cattle out of the way of those fires. Whenever the fires can take that amount of land that quickly, it is, it is, it is just horrifying. I nearly cry when I see pictures that are sent to me by my friends in the cattle industry out there. So those, there's cattle that will die. There's cattle that will be misplaced. But keep in mind that we all eat food three times a day, theoretically. Cows eat all day long. That food is gone. Now, is hay price is going to go up. Now, all those calves from Florida that go out west, will they be able to graze those lands? Not real quick. So the answer is yes. All right. The next question is, how will conservation area parcels be prioritized for acquisition? Well, we kind of look at it as a holistic equation you know we want to first look at size uh, we want to we actually go out and we look at the parcel um, we kind of document uh, what's on the parcel is it a dump site is it um, you know are people using it in ways that they really shouldn't is there good habitat uh, are there wetlands that, that need help or don't need help so we look at the the type of the parcel again where it's located Again, I think the highest priority would be ones that kind of back up next to some of the pre-existing initiatives of conservation. But yeah, so we just kind of look at it as a whole. Is it, is it able to be um, maintained or improved? Or, it, you know, so we just look at it all together and then make a, 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 a collective decision on the, the parcels. And then another one that says, what habitats um, are most of the opportunity areas in the wildlife corridor? So Josh, you wanna answer that one? That's a great question. Um, so actually 88% of the opportunity areas are either ranch or timber. So it's very heavily skewed towards working lands. And that's indicative of the fact that in Florida we're very rarely choosing between natural habitats and development today means that when we are having that decision, those natural lands are especially special to us, um, but we're more often choosing between working lands and development. Uh, so only about 12% is of the opportunity areas are natural lands or probably a little bit less than that uh, because there's some agriculture that's not timber or ranching. Uh, but yeah, South Florida, you're mostly talking about ranches. North of Central Florida, you're mostly talking about working timber. And then most of the conserved areas are natural lands. You know, that's a legacy of, again, the conservation that was done long before this was called the Florida Wildlife Corridor. Great, thank you. Are there any programs that help farmers ad better adapt crops to soils, groundwater, and temperature changes to make the most of less land and leave some for conservation? I'll, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll take a stab at that, and, uh, and the, other, the other folks may also. Yes, a lot of it comes from seed companies. A lot of it comes from irrigation companies that want to sell you the products that are going to teach you that you don't have to water all the time because they're automatically going to send it to your phone. Um, and a lot of it comes from IFAS, University of Florida. I can tell you that right now we're putting an emphasis at Texas A&M and at University of Florida on developing forages that are more adaptable. We're looking at a slick hair gene in cattle, particularly in dairy cattle. Um, I do believe if we can truly embrace the fact that we need to look further than 10 years from now and embrace the fact that we need to look 500 years into the future. We've had cattle in Florida for five, over 500 years uh, I'm 68 years old. That, that means that 100 years goes by real quick. 
that I think we really need. It was a great question, by the way. Great question. And there needs to be more emphasis put on it. There will be more emphasis put on it. The more research, the more science, the more technology that we get. What we have today will not but what we have. It will not be what we have five years from now. But yes, there is a lot of people working on that, but not of scale, big scale yet, at least here in Florida. All right, I think we have time for uh, at least one more question. So, uh, so many good questions. Um, how do we best support and push our legislators to renew the farm bill? Are there items, actions that need to be listed, listed in there, I guess, into, into the farm bill? I think it's too late right now to be, be to, uh, changing the farm bill because actually they're looking at revamping the 2018 version right now. But it's talk to your congressman and it, you know, talk to your congressman and tell him what you really love about Florida. And then you have to tell him again and then again, because in the meantime, they're hearing from 98% or 98% of the population about their wells and about their roads and about their sewage and about uh, red tide and about all these different things. And the farm bill only comes around once in a while. If you really want to help talk to your senators and your representatives in the state of Florida, right now we had a, uh, we had an offer out there from uh, the Senate for $300 million for the rural family lands program. The house came back with $33 million. Then the Senate came. Then the Senate came back with a hundred thousand, a hundred million, and the House went to a hundred million. I happened to be sitting there when they did it. So we just tapped out at a hundred million. Now, now is when we really should have made friends with a lot of representatives and senators because right now the leadership is going to meet in Tallahassee. They have a sprinkle fund. They have a discretionary fund. Hopefully, the House and the Senate will agree to each one of them put in $50 million, somehow raise that up. We also have the Seminole Pact that's going on. There is an opportunity for Florida to get approximately, I'm telling you approximately, don't write it down, $100 million, but that would be on a first-come, first-served basis between Florida Forever, which is a great program, Florida Department of Agriculture's Rural and Family Lands Program, that they would split that then they would get some management cost out of that also. So if we could, I would say let's continually reach out to our senators and representatives. Well, I think that's a great note to end on. Thank you. Uh, please help give a round of applause for our excellent final panel.